Welcome to the eighth episode of Abbott and Credlin, a podcast where we explore the foundations, recent fortunes and future of politics at home and abroad. In this series, we're going to unpack not just what's happening, but how and why. Political history and philosophy, as well as the mechanics of politics, the behind the scenes stuff that as a former prime minister and a PM's chief of staff, we both know all too well. If you want to delve more deeply into the strengths and weaknesses of our public life today, well, this podcast is meant for you. My name is Peter Credlin. I'm a broadcaster at Sky News and a columnist for The Australian and the Sunday News Corp papers in Australia. Joining me, of course, is Australia's 28th Prime Minister, Tony Abbott. Tony, this is... I guess our last podcast for this year, we're not far off the end of the parliamentary year in Australia. For some time, the government's been taking water. I think the real marker of that was a comprehensive defeat of Labor's plan in Australia to put race into our constitution. But since then, it's been some tumultuous times, particularly on issues like detention, border protection the economic front, very obviously. And so what I'd like today to focus on is where to now, given the state of politics in Australia, and I guess some really significant global challenges, not just in the Middle East, but also with China and elsewhere and across the board economically, where to now for the centre-right and any glimmers of hope we can see for 2024? I know you've just uh, not long come back from an inaugural conference uh, in London as the ARC conference. It was the Alliance for Responsible Citizenship, the first very unique forum of its type. Tell us about ARC. Well, thanks, Peter. In some ways, these are uh, dispiriting and vexing times. But as they say, it's always darkest just before the dawn. And I think there are some signs of hope, which I'll come to in a minute. Mm. I suppose the worst feature of the last few weeks, at least for me, has been the extraordinary reaction to the October 7 atrocities in Israel, where we've seen massive demonstrations on the streets of Western cities, including London, including Sydney and Melbourne, in favour of the perpetrators of those massacres. A terror organisation, let's be very It's a death cult. Uh, It's certainly a listed terror organisation in Australia and elsewhere, but it's essentially a death cult uh, akin to ISIS, Mm -hmm. uh, Mm -hmm. which, as we saw, uh, committed unspeakable atrocities a a few years ago uh, before being more or less suppressed inside Iraq and in most of Syria. These demonstrations, which are not anti-war demonstrations, they're not peace demonstrations, Uh, effectively by demanding a ceasefire in Gaza, they are Mm pro-Hamas demonstrations. Mm -hmm. These demonstrations, in my view, indicate uh, a moral derangement in Western countries, in the Anglosphere in particular. Uh, They seem to combine uh, the passions of recent migrants, and in a sense that's understandable, with This drumbeat of self-loathing on the part of so many Western intellectuals who see the history of the West, of the Anglosphere in particular, as one of exploitation, of racism, of white privilege, and so on. And they've somehow twisted the facts to turn Israel not into the only liberal democracy in the Middle East, but into an epitome of colonialism Mm -hmm. uh, and white privilege. And on this basis, uh, they've managed to get tens of thousands of people onto the streets in Sydney and Melbourne. They've managed to get hundreds of thousands of people onto the streets uh, in London and tens of thousands in many other European capitals uh, and in the United States. And look, this is profoundly depressing. On the other hand, as you say, we've just had the ARC or uh, Alliance for Responsible Citizenship conference in London, which brought together 1,500 thinkers and doers, principally from the Anglosphere, but 
from around the world. Yeah, it's too. seventy-three or five countries, something like that. It's quite quite a significant mix. Exactly, the board. exactly. It it was it was a, a a very good mix, perhaps dominated by the Anglosphere with a very significant Australian contingent, to talk about the better story, mm-hmm. which the organisers believe can and should be told about our history, about our present, and about our future. A future which will be better if we remember our achievements, we remember our strengths, and we build on them tomorrow, next week, next month, next year, and forever. Because I still think that the Anglosphere, to borrow a phrase from Ronald Reagan, is the last best hope of mankind. I still think that the Anglosphere, again, to borrow a Reagan phrase, is a shining city on a hill. Uh, I think the fact that so many people from all over the world can't wait to get to Mm. Anglosphere countries, whether it's all those people crossing the channel to get to to Britain, uh, whether it's all of the people still waiting in Java to get to Australia, whether it's those uh, uh, crossing into the United States in vast numbers. At one level, this indicates a failure of border protection no longer in Australia, but at least in Britain and the United States. At another level, it is an illustration of the ongoing gravitational pull of societies which are as free, as fair, and as prosperous as any on earth. So the great thing about the ARC conference is that it wasn't just the standard, I suppose, lament about how bad things are (laughs) and have been. It was also an attempt by a whole range of different thinkers to talk about our fundamental strengths and to present a picture of uh, stronger families, uh, which are the bedrock of any society, of a economic system that cultivates abundance rather than tries to shut itself down, and of companies which have a genuine sense of social responsibility, which doesn't mean making donations to the latest fashionable cause, Mm, mm. but running themselves in a way which is genuinely respectful of workers, of customers, and of shareholders, uh, because that means delivering ultimately a very good product or service. So look, this uh, conference, it wasn't just about politics. It wasn't just about economics. It was deeply cultural, and there was even an important spiritual dimension to it, which I think counts as well. I think one of the uh, takeouts for me, and and, and I treated ARC almost like a a masterclass. When you're in the media and and you're contributing to the debate, you tend to run on the issues of the day and you're always drawing down, as you used to say uh, as PM, on your intellectual capital. Mm -hmm. And you've got to be assiduous about finding opportunities to top it up and to read more, to challenge your own thinking. I mean, it can't be just set and forget at any one point in time, whether it's on an issue like education or uh, social policy, foreign affairs or whatever, pushing yourself to read and to listen and to engage. I mean, that's the uh, fundamental criticism I have of young people today and of the left more broadly, that they're not challenging themselves. And uh, that was a, a lesson to me, you know, Peter, if you go, this is for you to sit and absorb and listen and, and, and get what you can out of it in terms of latest thinking. So that was a rare moment to stop and do all of those things. But the breadth of of the attendees, not just the contributors formerly on the stage, but all the other people you mingled with over the course of three days, I think was absolutely well worth it. But what came out of it as I flew home on the plane was for the first time in a long time, a real sense of optimism. Mm -hmm. Because when you're in the fight against the hard left, and they have been far better at taking on our institutions, we on the right particularly conservatives, had always thought the ship would right itself or people would be mugged by the, the, the reality and the truth of the conservative viewpoint. That's not really been the case, certainly with younger generations. And so you can get a bit despondent. You can feel as though we're just managing our decline. There was optimism out of mm-hmm. that conference. There was a sense of purpose that people attended wanting to make things better, wanting to make a difference, and as you say, wanting to tell a better story. And I think 
There is a good story to tell as conservatives. There is a great story to mount about defending the family. Mm -hmm. There's a terrific story to tell about the critical importance of of education. Yes, we can talk about where the curriculum lets us down, Mm -hmm. but where you get examples like Catherine Berberlissing's school in in London, where education is, is absolutely her life's mission and she is rebuilding patriotism and history and a reverence for you know judeo christian western traditions you can you can feel that she's turning the tide now you come away thinking that all of those things matter they should be defended they should be absolutely critical to the jobs of government and the job of the media and and i just i just it filled up my tank if i can say that it really filled up my tank well likewise peter i i thought it was great to uh to be in a, a place like like that without having to do too much talking oneself, without mm. having to carry the show, mm. but being able to listen to people who are familiar with the best that's been thought and said and are giving us their distilled wisdom about all of these things. And Catherine Burbel Singh was a highlight. Michael Schellenberger on energy was a highlight. Uh, Miriam Cates on the family, the young British MP, mm. Mm. Uh, was a highlight. I find Jordan Peterson very powerful. Jonathan Haidt. Jonathan Haidt, uh, yes, extraordinarily perceptive uh, social commentary about the pluses and the minuses of social media and what particularly constant people. social media exposure has done for the mental health of teenagers, mm. especially girls. John Anderson, our own John Anderson, former Deputy Prime Minister, was one of the key figures at the conference, Mm. and he gave several very important talks, but his talk on subsidiarity and the difference between individualism and proper perception of the individual in community, I thought was was important and deep and necessary. Just pull that apart because I think understanding the place of the individual, Mm -hmm. particularly the individual in conservatism on mm-hmm. the centre right. I mean, the Liberal Party prides itself on recognising the individual, the power mm-hmm. of the individual and the power of the individual vis-a-vis the dominance of the state, which is where the left tend to put the effort of their apparatus on a big state. But but John made a, a fine distinction mm-hmm. on the point about the individual in community and individualism. Correct, correct. And look... <laughs> I always would support the, well, my instinct would always be to support the individual against the state. But I think it was John Donne who said, no man is an island Mm -hmm. entire Mm -hmm. and whole unto himself. And we are only realised as individuals uh, because we exist in a context, a context of family, a context of neighbourhood, a context of country. And that doesn't mean that we're dominated by our siblings or our parents. It doesn't mean that we're completely shaped by our our neighbourhood or indeed by our country and our culture. But there is an interrelationship between the Mm -hmm. individual Mm -hmm. and everything else. I mean, it's the different individuals who create the social fabric which allows each one of them to flourish. And yes, we, we need to appreciate the rights and the dignity of every individual, but we need also to appreciate the wonders of the society, the culture, the civilization, which has enabled each individual to be truly him or herself. This is often where, I guess, conservatives and libertarians depart. Mm -hmm. As an example, the issue of freedom of speech. Mm -hmm. Incredibly important, absolutely defend most particularly the things I don't want to hear, the things I don't agree Mm -hmm. with. But I think a conservative will have a line on the edges Uh, of where free speech can cross and become something that's destructive. And, I mean, anti-Semitism is a very good example of that. Right now, yes. Mm. You know, some libertarians will say, well, you know, uh, there is no constraint on Mm. free speech. And that, I think, is John's point about individuals being incredibly important, Mm. but Mm. they also have to live within a community. Mm. Yeah, I, I think these are some of the challenges we have as people on the centre-right who are concerned where the West is headed. Mm -hmm. What came out of ARC, I think, was this, I guess, recommitment of thinkers and writers and, as you say, doers 
parliamentarians and and others, corporate leaders from around the world Mm -hmm. to say, uh, let's not fall into this trap of thinking that there is an an inevitable decline. Let's not fall into the trap of managing the decline. Let's let's basically have a resistance movement and a fight back. Yeah. And if there is a decline in the West and in the Anglosphere in particular, let's be clear, it won't just be us, it'll be the wider world that are the losers. Because if you look at the world in 2020, prior to the pandemic, uh, prior to the Ukraine war, prior to the recent eruption in the Middle East, prior to all of the, I guess, renewed strategic antagonisms between the United States and China, it had never been more free, more fair, more rich, and more safe for the vast majority of people. And that's essentially the result of the ideas which have been articulated by Western thinkers down the centuries, and at least in the post-war period, uh, protected by American, in particular, Mm. uh, blood and treasure. Because while you can often be critical of aspects of American foreign policy, there's no doubt whatsoever that no country has the strength and the benevolence to be the world's policeman, and the world does need a policeman. In the 19th century, it was Britain. In the 20th century, other than in that regrettable period of American isolationism between Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. the First and Second World Wars, it's been the United States, helped by Britain, Australia, and its other allies. And if we lose that because of our own self-doubt and because of the corrosive influence of uh, deconstructionism and all the other horrible things that have been produced by the long march of the left through the institutions, the world will be a poorer, darker, more dangerous place. And all of the things that the left used to support, uh, like the rights of minorities, will Mm. suddenly be uh, uh, at grave risk because uh, uh, there is no authoritarian society anywhere in the world right now which is as respectful of the rights of minorities uh, as the West and in particular the Anglosphere. Yeah, it's interesting. I saw a poster today, you know, queers for Palestine. Uh, if, if they turned up in Palestine, if they turned up in Gaza, their pronouns would be was and were. Um, but but <laughs> yeah. this is this is the whole story of the mm. left. I mean, mm. they've abandoned women. Yeah. Uh, they're, they're not at all sticking up for the rights of equality, the Martin mm-hmm. Luther King mm-hmm. uh, edict from 60 years ago, that was certainly almost washed away mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. with their arguments mm-hmm. on things like The Voice. And I think there's a real sense that, at least in Australia, uh, and this was referenced in London, that the silent majority were not prepared to be silent anymore. A- and, you know, a lot of your your contacts and colleagues in the UK and elsewhere, they, they took a lot of heart from what they had seen play out in Australia on The Voice, didn't they? Exactly. And uh, Jacinda Price uh, gave a, a wonderful presentation to mm. the wider uh, Off the conference. cuff, I might add. You yeah. know, gee, she's good. Gee, Look, she's uh, good. Jacinda is uh, certainly the one of the real stars of contemporary Australian public life, uh, a person who uh, has the lived experience, if as they say, of... Uh, deprivation. Mm -hmm. And I recently read uh, Bess, Jacinda's mother's account of growing up in and around Yundamu, where a lot of people were indeed uh, survivors of the last authenticated massacre uh, that took place in Australia, the Coniston Massacre, which was a dreadful business. But uh, Bess's grandfather was obviously a, a, a man of great magnanimity and character, and uh, he uh, became uh, reconciled Mm -hmm. uh, to uh, mainstream Australia, if I might use that term, Uh, worked very closely with uh, the religious superintendent who was running the relevant mission, worked hard as an underpaid labourer to support our war effort, and ultimately His family then produced Bess, who was a minister in the Northern Territory government, a wonderful, Mm -hmm. wonderful woman. Who who had a tough life. Very tough life. Herself married very young or or married off. Very tough life. In a cultural way, very young. And and had to show tremendous strength of character to uh, 
I guess, take the good uh, from her traditional Indigenous culture while at the same time marrying it with the best of contemporary Australian yeah. culture. So, look, a wonderful story by people who have seen the bad and the good of modern mm. Australia, who mm. have seen the bad and the good of Indigenous Australia and are able to appreciate both. And so her leadership of the campaign against the voice, I think, was uh, truly remarkable, quite seismic. And, and yes, our decision to reject this manifestation of identity politics, this very corrosive manifestation of identity politics, has certainly been noticed right around the world. One of the other things I, I picked up, which um, I think parlayed well into the way the campaign for the yes vote was run in this country and the preponderance of uh, of corporates to be lectured by union super funds or woke boards or whatever, disregarding the views of customers or, or ordinary shareholders to donate millions of dollars to the yes vote, a very divisive debate that should have had no place for companies, mm. but they were there. What I learnt at ARC is this real pushback, uh, particularly in the United States, but I think it's got it's got opportunity right around the world for pension funds and other organisations to 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 force corporates to get back to the job of being a corporation. Mm -hmm. Because one of the things that's happened, I think particularly over the last 30 years that I've been involved in politics, is to see different layers of government cross over into each other, mm -hmm. duplication of services, duplication of spending, so that everybody does a little bit of everything but no one actually takes responsibility mm. uh, for outcomes. So so local governments are out there campaigning on refugees rather than picking up the rubbish, as is their remit. Um, state governments are wasting money on things that don't matter but not fulfilling their requirement to fund government schools, carping about not being paid enough out of Canberra when it's never been Canberra's job mm. to fund, say, state schools. And then Canberra be basically becoming the lender of last resort for everybody else and corporates and the private sector who should be out there building wealth and prosperity for the nation, you know, running around on identity politics or, you know, climate catastrophism or whatever it might be. So the erosion of the system in the West where there was a delineation of responsibilities, even right down to the public-private dichotomy where parents had ultimate responsibility mm -hmm. for raising their children, parents were able to exercise choice in the education they chose for their child and had some say over things in the curriculum that should be the remit of parents, that's been taken off the family in time. And, and all of this contributes to, I guess, a worrying sense that you, not, not that we've lost our way, but we're almost cannibalising mm. ourselves and our system. And I guess looking at the experience of The Voice, people around the world said, okay, that gives us a bit of hope. And me listening to a whole range of people, you know, that pension fund guy is a, just a little example, that there are people pushing back and making a difference. I can remember, Peter, when I was at uni, uh, it was one of the cries of the Marxists that everything is political. Now, back then, most of us knew that politics was politics, business was business, family was family, neighbourhood was neighbourhood, religion was religion, politics had no real part. Politics as such had no real part in any of these things. But it is interesting how politicised everything has become in recent times. I mean, one of the observations I found myself making at one point is that we have far fewer real business people in politics these days, but we have far more political people in business these days, which is one of the reasons why business has become so, so woke. So, look, I think that, as you say, there was an enthusiasm for getting on with things, mm. for allowing everyone and everything to be more sovereign in its own sphere mm -hmm. so that we didn't look to government for all the answers. We didn't feel that uh, Big Brother or Big Sister was looking over our shoulder all the time, judging us. And again... I think this is a wonderfully liberating thing. And as you might know, Peter, one of the things I'm involved with is the Ramsey Centre for Western Civilization. And I've got to say that the youngsters who are coming out of these great books courses, whether it's through Ramsey or 
through Campion College. Uh, these are very enthusiastic and impressive young people, and I just think that uh, just maybe it's becoming cool to be conservative, mm. and if we can get out from under this suffocating blanket of political correctness, we'll all be a lot happier and we'll all be a lot more successful. I think one of the, again, the voice, what was, to be honest, a surprise to me mm. was that the no vote was across all de demographics mm -hmm. in majority. It was across genders in majority. It was also across, in, in the end, states mm. in a majority. I didn't think that would necessarily be the case. I thought maybe the, the younger generation, 18 to 35s, might have been hard to get in the end. Now, that says that there is at least something there. What that something is is still up for debate. I think uh, be careful not to over analyze it and call it what it isn't. But it, it but it is at least a beachhead that says whereas not far gone as the left would like to make us think that there is a groundswell of people out there who want the best for each other and our and our communities and our country. That there are things that they still value in the Australian society that we, and I hate that term progressive, I won't use it, but that we are not the, the left enclave that they might have us think. Now, I think that belief has been a little bit tested ever since the atrocities in Israel and the reaction in, in particular of the media and, and some communities around the world to almost within a month of it deny that the atrocities even occurred. Uh, to make this about uh, basically Israeli aggression, of which it's not. So we'll see where we land come Christmas. But I think looking into next year, I'm probably more optimistic than I was this time last year. But I think only if good people on the right around the world understand, we won't have many other opportunities to turn this around. And we need to turn this around. Yeah, two points. Peter Dutton's role in the voice debate should, I think, persuade people on the centre-right that it is possible uh, to take a principled position on something which is currently unpopular mm. and argue it through to a degree of popularity. Uh, Howard Costello and the GST yes. is another example yeah. from the past, yeah. yes. So, so that's the first point I'd make. The second point I'd make is that, and this is taking up your observations a moment ago, I don't think we can say uh, from the voice result that 60% of the population can't wait to vote Liberal. Mm. I, we can't say that. No, no. Because while I think the 60% who voted no are going to find it very hard to find a home in the Green Left Labor Party, mm. which was to a man and a woman barracking for the voice, at least publicly, I'm not sure that the coalition is as yet their natural home, because let's face it, there were so many people inside the coalition itself who bizarrely failed to grasp that a liberal conservative party could not under any circumstances support something as identitarian as, mm. the, as the voice. So I think there's work to be done on the centre-right of public life but I think there is hope. And a Liberal National Coalition, which is sensible on social issues and pragmatic on economic issues, mm. could uh, yet again, once again, command a strong majority. And let's see what happens in the new year. Well, I think that's a, given the season, that's a very optimistic uh, note to end up on. I think the the one Australian facing a torrid summer, other than the firefighters, is uh, probably the Prime Minister, but that's a conversation for next year. I look forward to it. Tony Abbott, it's been great to share the microphone with you this year. Thanks, Peter. Have a lovely Christmas. And you. <laughs> <laughs>